And the day started off normally enough. Well, as normal as life after the demonic invasion could be. They arrived four years ago. I was only twelve when they came and watched in horror as they dropped from the sky, riding beasts of metal and fire. According to some of the villagers, who often travelled to the nearby towns, the demons flew straight to our capital, brushed past our best soldiers and forced the king to surrender. The demons promptly deposed the old king and chose another ruler to be their puppet. They travelled in their metal war beast to every town and village in their land, and rounded up all the menfolk to toil away in their mines. They were digging for something near the capital. They told us through their puppet king. Some kind of metal that would help them in a great celestial struggle against a rival group of demons. An empire that stretched across the heavens and crushed all mortals who lived under their authority with an iron boot. The demons would often claim to be protecting us from this empire, but to be honest, their shadowy enemy didn't sound that much worse than them. On an otherwise normal day, however, all that changed. Most of the day was no different to any other. I helped my mother with the housework in the morning, and spent the rest of the day playing with my friends in the fields behind our village. It was in the early evening, though, when our lives were turned upside down for the second time in my life. Mother and I were sitting inside our small house, eating dinner. Well, calling it dinner was a bit generous. The demons would often raid our farms and storehouses and take the food for themselves. After they had taken their share and left on their black metal monsters, there was precious little to feed ourselves with. I was chewing on an undercooked scrap of meat when a burst of bright light from somewhere outside made us both look out the tiny window. I stood timidly behind Mother as she walked to the door and looked outside. Another flash, this one not as bright, caused us to look up at the sky. To our amazement, it seemed as if a great celestial battle was being fought in the heavens, as explosions of demonic energy lit up the sky. Oblivious to the world around me, I walked outside, enraptured by the fierce contest erupting the stars above us. As I looked closer, I saw that some of the brighter stars were moving. If I squinted just right, I could just make out that the moving stars were flinging red and green lances of arcane energy at each other. By now, the rest of the village had come out of their homes. We all gathered in the town square, watching in awe at the unfathomable sights before us. It seemed as if the sky itself was threatening to split open, as flash after flash dazzled our uncomprehending eyes. What's going on? One of my friends asked, her eyes wide in amazement. Maybe those other demons have finally arrived, I suggested. That empire, or whatever they're called. The heavenly battle continued to rage on, seemingly with no end in sight. Eventually the thrill of seeing two demonic hordes attack each other wore off, and the crowd slowly moved away. I was one of the last to leave. As I turned away, I cast one look back at the night sky. It may have been my imagination, but it almost seemed as if there were less flashes now, as if the struggle was coming to an end. Shrugging. I turned away and walked back inside, eager to finish my humble meal and get to sleep. The next morning, as I went about my morning chores, I was startled by the sound of a bell being rung in warning. The demons! Someone was shouting. The demons are coming! The sound of panicking villagers was drowned out by the unmistakable deep growl of the demons' war beasts. Looking out the window, I could see the black coloured hulks lumber towards us, kicking up vast clouds of dust behind them. As they drew nearer, I saw that one of the beasts looked different to the others. Most of the demonic creations had an angular, boxy look to them. This one, however, had a strange round head. It had four metal snouts that were pointed up at the sky, turning in every direction, as if it were looking for something. The black beasts charged through the village's north gateway, stopping the square. There were five of the arcane creatures. Each one opened up and disgorged a host of unholy warriors, who spread out among the houses, preparing defences around the south gate. What's going on? I asked Mother, who shook her head. I don't know, Clistry, she said quietly. Move away from the window, dear. I did, as Mother asked. Moving away from the window, I still snuck the occasional glance outside, watching as the demons scurried about on their weird, unworldly legs. After several minutes, a new sound slowly made itself heard. A strange ethereal whine that threatened to silence even the hungry growls of the metal beasts that stood in our midst. The demons rushed around even more urgently now, shouting orders to each other in their harsh tongue. If I didn't know any better, I would have said they were scared. I didn't know whether that was a good thing or not. The strange beast with the four snouts turned its head around to face the direction of the noise. A split second later, it unleashed what I could only describe as hellfire, shooting arcane streams of unholy energy into the sky. A harsh clap echoed around us, followed by a whine that was higher pitched than the rest of the noise. Looking out the window, I caught the briefest glimpse of a fiery grey shape scream over the village. The differently pitched noise was cut off by the sound of something hitting the ground. A loud, roaring whoosh bloomed from the heavens, 
and the ground near the Black Beast erupted into fireballs and dust clouds. Looking up at the sky, I briefly saw what looked to me like large grey metal birds with demons riding inside them. I couldn't see exactly what these new sky demons looked like, but I saw enough to tell that they were very different from our occupiers. One of the flying monstrosities was smaller than the others, looking more like an insect than a bird. As I looked in fear and awe, it turned towards the black beast with the four snouts. The insect's mouth glowed bright orange, and a noise like the sky was being torn in half assaulted my ears. I quickly clapped my hands up to my ears and cowered beneath the windowsill. There was another thunderclap, followed by the sound of metal being torn and flung in all directions. Bravely peeking over the windowsill, I saw that the four snouted beast had been destroyed, and was reduced to a pile of flaming metal. With the strange creature gone, the metal creatures drew closer to our village. Me and Mother were almost deafened by the noise that reverberated around the house, as the sky demons unleashed their furious might onto the now confused hellspawn on the ground. It seemed as if the world itself was ending, such was the intensity. I clutched onto Mother for dear life, trying to find a small amount of comfort in this insanity. After several moments of infernal bombardment, the cacophony seemed to fade away, while the ever-present whining in the sky increased in pitch. Slipping away from my mother's protective grasp, I scuttled towards the door. Before she could stop me, I opened it just a crack. Peeking around the doorframe, I saw that the great birds had finally decided it was safe to land. With an elegance that belied their size and seeming unwieldiness, the metal bruise gently aligned on the ground. Within an instant of landing, the sky demons riding inside the flying fiends jumped out and began to attack any surviving defenders. Now that they were clear of their impish conveyance, I could more clearly make out the shape of these new creatures. The monsters that had been ravaging our land for the past four years looked like some kind of sea creature and walked around on weird tentacle looking limbs. They held their arcane battle stars and a pair of limbs that looked like a cross between their tentacles and our own arms. These new sky demons, however, were completely different. For one, they looked vaguely similar to us, although I couldn't see any hair or tails. They walked on two legs, had two arms, and held their own battle stars in hands that looked closer to ours than those of the other demons. That was where the similarities stopped. For one, the Sky Demons were completely covered in otherworldly armour that was coloured a peculiar greenish-brown and coated with a strange motor pattern. For another, they didn't have a mouth, instead having a strange snout that grew out from the lower part of their face before entering somewhere on their chest. They had two eyes that glowed green with undoubtedly malicious intent and more peculiar angled helmets that protected the top of their heads. The demons rushed out from the cover of their beasts, shouting orders to each other in their guttural, foreign language and waving each other forwards. As soon as one of them saw a tentacle demon, they would point their battle staff at it, and unleash a red lance of unholy energy that would kill their opponent almost instantly. The air around us reverberated with more bursts of arcane fire, and mystical zapping and chattering sounds echoed off the walls of the surrounding houses, as the droves of malignant creatures strove to destroy each other. To my horror, I saw that three of the tentacle demons were rushing towards our house. I barely managed to scurry away from the door before it burst open, and the demons scuttled inside, red beams of hellish energy flying in all directions behind them. One of the demons was hit by a beam and was killed crossing the threshold. I screamed in terror and ran back to Mother. Carrying behind her at the back of the room, I saw the remaining two demons crash behind the window, locked in an exchange of sorcerous energy with the sky demons. This carried on for only a couple of minutes, but each second seemed like hours to us. I was convinced that any minute now the sky demons would use one of their powerful spells to get rid of their foes by just destroying the house with us still inside it. That didn't happen though. Instead, one of the sky demons suddenly rushed through the doorway from the opposite side of the house from where the tentacle demons were looking. Before they could react, the newcomer had raised his battle staff to his shoulder and cast a spell that sent forth two red spears from the tip of the staff, each spear hurtling towards one of the tentacle demons. The spears found their mark, and the demons slumped to the ground, their battle staff slipping out of their lifeless hands and clattering to the floor. The victorious sky demon lowered his staff, apparently satisfied with the handiwork. Slowly turning his head, it eerily looked around the room. His green-eyed gaze fell on me and Mother as we shivered in fear. We stared at each other, the only noise inside the house being the hiss of the creature's breathing, and a strange muffled warbling coming from his head. To my surprise, the demons left us alone, instead heading back outside to help their comrades. After another handful of minutes, the sky demons vanquished our occupiers and stood victorious in the town square. As the sounds of the terrible battle faded away, the villagers fearfully began to creep out into the open. Me and Mother joined them, casting fearful looks at the demons as we looked around at the carnage that had been wrought. The still smoking bodies of the tentacle demons lay all around us, and their black metal beasts sat in ruins. A couple of the empty houses had been destroyed, and the smoke and flames from the ruined buildings added to the hellish imagery around us. The grey birds and insects continued to circle the village, 
They were wearing screams, threatening to deafen us. Everyone was wondering what these new sky demons would do to us. Would they kill us? Eat us? Kill us and then eat us? Or would they just take us as slaves for themselves? The demons, for their part, barely acknowledged us, and instead spread out among the village, keeping their battle stars by their sides, as if waiting for a potential attack. As we stood around, we became aware of the growl of war beasts slowly coming towards us. This time, though, it didn't sound the same as the tentacle demons' beasts. Looking towards the south gate, where most of the sky demons were standing, I could see a dust cloud being kicked up by something moving along the road. Sure enough, several war beasts soon hove into view, crossing the top of the ridge the village was built on. Unlike the beasts used by the tentacle demons, these beasts were smaller and sat lower to the ground. They were kind of the same as the armour worn by the demonic soldiers and bore similar patterns. As they lumbered through the gate, I saw that two or three of the beasts were much smaller than the rest and looked more like Oshless carriages. Several demons got out of the carriages and walked over to another group that was approaching them. Two of the demons began to talk with each other. Eventually, one of the demons started shouting to the ones standing by the strange self-moving carriage. They went aboard a large box out of the back of the carriage. Taking it to who I assume was their leader, they deposited the box at their feet and opened it up. The demons proceeded to perform what I could only describe as more of their witchcraft, taking things out of the box and assembling them into some kind of apparatus. We all stood around nervously, unsure of what was going to happen. Strangely enough, no one tried to run. Maybe we were all just too scared to. Once they were finished with their device, one of the demonic soldiers spoke into a small box that was connected to the rest of the arcane creation. After a few seconds, the device, a strange box attached to a long stand, emitted a harsh whine. Suddenly, it began to speak. Do not be afraid. A booming voice addressed us in our own language. We will not hurt you. We are the human empire. We are here to help you. A few minutes earlier. Sierra 7, this is Sierra 5. Form up on Patton Delta and steer heading on Vector 037. Drone recon has spotted four enemy victors, escorting a mobile AAA battery moving along the plains to the north. They're heading towards the village on Hill 328. They want us to take them out before the rest of the transports begin their landing. Over. Roger, Sierra 5. Uh, Naz telling me that Hill 328's in Grid 75A, is that correct? Over. Affirmative. Roger. We get any ground support on this one? We have an armored detachment moving out from LZ Bravo, but they'll be a few minutes behind us. All they'll be able to do is mop up the stragglers. Over. Roger. Private Walker only listened to the pilot chatter as he looked out of the open door of the VTOL transport. A couple hundred meters below him, the fields and plains of this alien, yet familiar world rushed past him at a few hundred kilometers per hour. Turning his attention to the LAS-55 rifle in his hands, he checked the energy weapon's charge and cooling level for the umpteenth time. Satisfied his weapon was in tip-top shape, he leaned back in his seat, trying to ignore how the gas mask and Seven suit he was wearing chafed against him. Why they had to wear the thing, only the Imperial Army mission planners knew why. Supposedly it was in case the squids used chemical or biological warfare. The private personally doubted they would. That could have side effects on the local primitive population, and the Shimla needed those primitives. The Shimla Confederation had invaded the planet four years ago, when they declared war on the Empire for the second time in the last century. The planet, whose name Walker had forgotten already, technically fell within the Empire's territory. But the Empire hadn't landed or contacted the native population. For one thing, they were too primitive to warrant a contact, having only recently entered their medieval period when the planet was first discovered 200 years ago. In more recent times, though, the main reason was that the Imperial ruling authorities simply didn't want to have to deal with more extraterrestrials. They had enough on their plate with the Confed's blustering, as well as the ingrates in the protectorates and residential districts. Adding another ET populated world into the fold would just give the squids another vector to sow discourse within the Empire. Or would have before they dropped the veil and launched their invasion. Alas, the planet contained some metal or other that the squids reckoned could be used to improve their starships. So, now that the Shimla had been pushed back from other, more important targets, the Imperial Army was rushed to this nameless dirt ball to liberate it from Confed occupation. The Army's Storm Commanders had secured a landing site for one of the monolithic landing craft to touch down, but Command was concerned about the enemy's mobile anti-air capacity, which was by Private Walker, the rest of his unit, as well as numerous other teams, were currently sitting inside uncomfortable as, or heck, Seaburn suits, to eliminate the threat, so that the rest of the fleet could begin landing. We're five minutes out from the objective. The voice of his commander, Lieutenant Thorne, hissed over the radio. Everyone get ready. And just as a heads up, Recon has confirmed the squids to be camped in a civilian village. So watch your fire. Another soldier, Corporal Shell, scoffed quietly. 
Damn, Prims are so stupid they'd probably run in front of our bullets anyway, he muttered darkly. Stow that talk, Shale, barked Thorn. Save it for the squids. Yes, sir, Shale replied sullenly. Everyone else in the transport began to check their weapons, and the door gunners ratted the charging handles of their EMAG-42 automatic railguns. Walker, having already checked his laser rifle, checked his CAF-111, Caster's submachine gun, and the CAS-91 Caster's pistol he carried as a sidearm. Looking outside again, Walker saw the soldiers in the VTOLs on either side of his transport prepare their own weapons. There were five transport VTOLs and a small airborne assault force, with a pair of AV-85 attack VTOLs providing fire support. Sensors are ping incoming AAA, the pilot of the lead transport reported. All craft evade. Walker gripped the sides of his seat tightly, as the aircraft lurched to one side to evade the incoming plasma fire. The transport on their right wasn't quick enough, and burst into flames as a stream of superheated energy impacted it. The craft dropped out of the sky, screaming over the village before plowing into a nearby field. We're in range, somebody called out. Let them have it! The flight broke formation and began to circle the village. The door gunners opened up on the confused Schimmler, firing round after round into the enemy forces, while the attack VTOLs fired their rockets to the armored vehicles. Smoke and dust from the explosions billowed into the sky, making it hard to tell what was going on down below. I am reading enemy forces on thermal, one of the gunners reported. They're taking shelter in one of the houses. Do you read any civilians in there with them? Negative, sir. You are clear to engage. Roger, engaging. The gunners strafed the house with the EMAG-42, while one of the AV-85 shot a couple of rockets into it. The combined fire turned the simple hut into splinters. All the while, laser beams and plasma bursts shot into the sky around the transports. That anti air is beginning to annoy me, the voice of one of the pilots came over the channel. I'm taking it out. Stand by. Looking out of the door, Walker saw the attack VTOL open fire on the alien turret with his powerful minigun. He could make out the sound of the gun even above the noise of the transport's engines. anti air has been eliminated, the pilot reported, as the black-coloured alien vehicle erupted into flames. You boys are clear to land. Roger. Engines rising to a crescendo, the transports touched down inside the village square, and the soldiers quickly disembarked. Walker was suddenly glad for his respirator and silk suit, as it made breathing in the smoke-filled environment much easier. Go, go, go! Thorn called out. Secure this area. Shell, take your squad around the west side. Yes, sir, the corporal called back. Walker, Gomez, Pierre, on me, left side, let's go. The soldiers rallied around Shell and began to sweep the village. Almost immediately, they came across a group of Schimmler. The thermal and night vision sensors embedded in Walker's helmet made picking out the targets almost too easy. Raising the last 55, he centered the crosshair on one of the squid-like aliens and fired. A laser beam, flaring bright red in all the smoke and airborne debris, shot out from the barrel and bored straight into the enemy soldier. Releasing the trigger, he shifted his aim and fired again, filling another opponent. The squad made sure work of the extraterrestrials and carried on their sweep. The whining zap of lasers, the chattering rattle of calf 111s, and a clap of explosions echoed all around the soldiers as they walked around the village, terminating any hostiles they found with extreme prejudice. Watch those three squids on the left! Someone suddenly shouted into the radio. They're heading for a civic building. Roger, I see them. A distorted, tinny rendition of a last 55 being fired echoed over the channel. Got one. Hold on. They've just ducked inside. I can see them on thermal, but I can't get a clear shot. The civilians inside. They're too close. Damn prims! Shell exclaimed, always lousing everything up. Looking down a narrow alleyway between two of the native huts, Private Walker could see another squad trading shots with a group of Schimmler, currently taking refuge inside a nearby house. As he looked over the house, an idea struck him. Cover me, he called to his squadmates. I'm going to try and surprise them from the side. Copy, Private Gomez replied. Crouching low, Walker darted around the alley and made a wide loop around the square until he was standing at the hut's corner. This is Walker, I'm going in he said over the radio, before darting around the corner and through the door. The two squids inside were too busy keeping the squad outside pinned down, so they didn't notice the private as he raised his rifle to his shoulder. By the time they did notice, there were already two laser beams heading towards them, one beam for each ET. The shots found their mark, and the Schimmler fell to the ground, dead. Switching on his thermal and night vision, Private Walker scanned the rest of the house. The walls were just thin enough that he'd be able to make out if any more squids were hiding inside. All he found, though, were two native civilians, carrying at the back of the room. Walker stared at them for a few seconds, the only sounds being the hiss of his gas mask respirator and the faint echo of radio chatter. Deciding they were harmless, he turned around and walked back outside to rejoin the battle. It was over in minutes. The Schimmler had been eliminated. All the soldiers had to do now was wait for the ground forces to invade, so that they could try and smooth things over with the natives. Winning hearts and minds, Commander called it. 
Walker wondered how they were meant to win hearts and minds while dressed in something that probably looked like their version of Satan. After a few minutes of waiting, the armoured convoy arrived. Lieutenant Thorne and a few other soldiers walked over to the lead vehicle to greet the commander, a Captain Ellison. What's the situation, Lieutenant? The captain asked, after clambering out of the cramped armoured car. Sir, Thorne began. All hostiles have been eliminated. We were just waiting on you to set up the translator. I see. Sergeant? The captain turned to another soldier. Get command on the horn. Tell them the fleet can begin landing in this sector. Yes, sir, the sergeant replied. Sorry we couldn't get here sooner. Ellison turned back to Lieutenant Thorne. But you know how the army is with its logistics. Yes, sir, the lieutenant nodded sagely. Okay, people. Ellison turned to a couple of his men. Kurt, Schroeder, get that translator and speaker set up. The soldiers in question nodded and pulled a large box out of the boot of the captain's car. They opened it up to reveal an amplifier with a large portable speaker. Attached to the amp was a small translation computer and a microphone. The computer was filled with linguistic data copied from a Schiller starship captured in orbit of this planet. Specifically, it contained data on the native language and how to translate that into Imperial Common, using the Schiller language as an intermediary. Granted, with such an approach some information would be lost, but the message the soldiers were trying to convey was fairly straightforward. The soldiers quickly set up the device, and gave the microphone to Captain Ellison. Do not be afraid, he spoke into the mic. We will not hurt you. We are the human empire. We are here to help you. After a few seconds, the commuter passed a speech into the native language, and outputted it through the speaker. The translated words of what the soldiers hoped were reassurance were soon being broadcast to the growing crowd of nervous villagers. Walker couldn't help but wonder if the natives would accept the empire's help, as he looked around the devastated village. Well, they hadn't killed any of the villagers here, they had destroyed two houses, albeit empty ones, and probably traumatised the inhabitants for life. That kind of thing could breed resentment, and while the Empire wasn't planning on staying here any longer than necessary, any hostile sentiment would make their job a lot harder. One thing was sure though, he thought, as the faint sound of powerful starship engines slowly began to make itself heard. The Empire might have won the round, but the battle for this planet was far from over, and the end of the war was still nowhere in sight.